come with us now, if you dare, down a rickety staircase into a dank, dark basement. What awaits the Saturday Night Freak Show? <laughs> Hey, thanks for listening to the Saturday Night Freak Show podcast, where a movie talk show podcast comes your way every Saturday, whether you're ready for it or not, in our quest for total world domination. And we want you to help us out with that by hitting that like or subscribe button wherever you found us. All of that stuff helps us get found by other like-minded folks like you who are into the same crazy, weird, and sometimes gross and disgusting things that we are. These are the internet radio superstars. Holly, Michaela, John, and I'm Colin. And tonight we watched a movie which was chosen by Sean. I mean, let's just get into it. What'd you make us watch? Uh, we watched a movie that proves that nothing good comes out of New Jersey. We watched nothing but trouble from the air. 1991, the 30th anniversary this year. Uh huh. And directed by none other than Daniel Aykroyd. <laughs> okay, so of the Aykroyd brothers, it, apparently. So has he directed previous to this movie? Not at all. Could you tell? Has he directed after this movie? Not at all. Ouch. <laughs> and I am not surprised to hear that. <laughs> Well, you know, it's a world's uh, a shot, better who, place for that, you know? Yeah. Uh, let's, yeah. let's, we'll add a plus off the bat. Who shot this movie? Dean Cundy. Dean Cundy shot this movie. Yeah. Really? That poor man. Not, he deserves better. Dean <laughs> Cundy, uh, for those of you who are not in the know, who's Dean Cundy? Dean Cundy was, for the longest time, John Carpenter's cinematographer. Um, I mean, if you know, uh, you should know Dean Cundy. Uh, Steven Spielberg's cinematographer for a bunch of movies he's done um do you do i mean he, you yeah, know, if you've seen a movie in the past 40 years you've seen a dean cundy movie he did, much. didn't jurassic, he do jurassic park oh, okay, jurassic that's park right. yep. and and he did i i did well, I know and everybody's i am did a bunch of um, uh, zemeckis movies he did um yes death becomes her right was, and the, yeah, back, the free back to the death future movies her. Um, but the, yep. it's always weird. And I think we talked about this before, like, you know, um, why is like, it always seems that John Carpenter's early stuff with Dean Cundy has what we ascribe the John Carpenter look. And then yep. Dean Cundy goes off on his own and neither guy's style looks the same. Like Dean Cundy's stuff does not look like Dean Cundy stuff. Like this is, it, it looks like anybody could have shot this. I'm sorry, sir. If you're listening, <laughs> Um, it's true though. It's true. Like he was definitely phoning it in on this one. Well, yeah, but I mean, I, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference between the, the cinematographer and this and uh, death becomes her back to the future. I mean, they're all capably shot. He's a pro, you know? Oh, Spielberg. Yeah. He did that video game. Uh, Steven Spielberg's director's chair. Anybody, anybody where you got to actually like make a movie that had Quentin Tarantino in it. Right. You could like shoot. This was a game. It was a video game. Yeah. Oh Yeah. <laughs> Oh, yeah, never trying to turn this into a, a Fox <laughs> what, series as well. What system was this for? Uh, PC. I PC will game. track this down. Probably this for like the, the 486 or something like that back in those days. Um, so nothing but trouble. Okay, so I am the nothing but trouble virgin coming into this uh, movie. All three of my freak show. It's a really gross way to phrase it, especially seen. considering this movie, Colin. <laughs> um, and so I was, so this, we, I guess we got to set this up. Uh, this movie has haunted the Saturday night freak show for, uh, several years now. Right. Yes. As, uh, so this is basically, I have approached this movie like it's an urban myth. Um, <laughs> I mean, the way we've talked about it, you'd have to at this point. <laughs> because it's it's something that once you've seen it, there are certain things burned into your brain for eternity, and you can't yeah. help but be triggered by any time you, rem you remember it, you know? Really? Right. Okay, yeah. so I watched it tonight, so now I'm kind of, because now we got to get into this, because, like, seriously, yeah. every time this movie was brought up, there was threats of mutiny. Like, was. Yeah. Some people were not going to show. show up to this show if this movie was chosen to be watched. Yeah, you're lucky I'm, I'm here right now. My internet might mysteriously <laughs> drop out in the middle of this. And I feel like I feel like since the first time it was mentioned with this foursome, I feel like it was like the movie countdown. Like our timer started. 
Mm -hmm. because we had mentioned how much we hate this to Sean and it was only a matter of time that he would force us to watch it. Right. So the first day we mentioned this movie, we basically learned our death day. (laughs) You are, you are correct, Holly. Um, So Mm -hmm. what you're saying is this is your fault. Oh no! Blame Sean. Don't like, there is, for victim blaming. What you're saying is equal blame to go around. I agree. Don't you dare. I agree with you, Holly. Don't you, you are dare. Correct. Thank you for taking up your end of this. Um, Not I appreciate it. I, I don't want to hold this burden all myself. You can go but fuck yourself. You know what? Sean. Somebody somebody oh, had to do it, Holly. It, somebody had to have the <laughs> balls to bring this movie to the pre oh. show. Holly didn't have any balls in this situation, Sean. It wasn't you. Holly and I previously said the only way that this show, this movie, would be covered is if like it was the end of the show like this is our descent into <laughs> insanity and the right. show's over now yeah so basically right. sean this was you choosing to end the freak show that's oh, what just so are you guys are you guys not coming back next week because i'll be <laughs> no, here i'll be here <laughs> yeah that's what i thought I mean, you're expecting me to mentally recover from this in a week you're, so you're also you know. alive and talking right now i think we're uh, i think we can get through this together i think we can get through this well this kind like of if- I feel like if this wasn't quarantine and we weren't doing this from home, Michaela and I'd I would have lot. bailed. I feel like we would have bailed. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. Because it's really hard to bail excuse. in this situation. Yeah, you know? I was like, we didn't have an excuse to miss it because it's like, well, we're at home. We have to do this. Right, right. we can oh, do this. Sean, this is, I mean, I, this is why I brought it because I'm like, they can't go anywhere. John, when you told us, <laughs> unless Michaela was going to be like, I'd rather get COVID. I'm going outside. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So, so no, so listener, you're kind of, that's a little insight into the, the tenor of the atmosphere here in this charged virtual, uh, reality in which we experienced this movie tonight. So I guess, you know, we got to talk about like, what are these deep seated traumas caused by this movie? First of all, what I'm curious about again, first time watchers. So I need to know, uh, Holly, when did you first, uh, when were you first exposed what, what age were you when you first saw Nothing But Trouble? Mm-hmm. Sure. Um, you know me. I have a terrible memory. I, I very seldomly can be like, I remember when I watched this. I remember where I was. Blah, blah. I, I don't feel like I ever say that. You guys all say that, but I feel like I never do because I have a terrible memory. I will did, tell you right fucking now. Did baby Holly look over no. at the clock and be like, it's 3.15 in the afternoon yeah, on was, April 17th of 1996. Old. I'm marking this down old. in my memory. Yes, I was 10 years old. It was 1995. It was the month of June, and it was in my Uncle Mark's basement. <laughs> I can tell you right now, he's the one that made me watch it, and I have not been the same since. Well, damn, Ma- Uncle Mark. All right, Michaela. Michaela, when when were you? When did nothing but trouble touch you? Um, I first <laughs> where on the doll it touches me in a way I don't like. Yeah. Um, so where on I- the giant baby did this movie touch? <laughs> you? The giant oiled up diapered baby uh, that lives in a junkyard um so i i had first heard of this movie how did this get that how did this get made to episode on this years and years ago and i remember listening to the episode and i couldn't follow anything they were talking about it sounded like they were all having a stroke and i was like <laughs> okay are they all just jumping around the plot of this movie are nope. they exaggerating I, I honestly thought they were just really exaggerating for comedy so um, my husband was like, well, I have that movie. We should watch it. So you, you should really like experience it so you can get what they're talking about. So we watched it. I made it probably three quarters of the way through before I was like, this is so nauseating and gross to me. I cannot watch anymore. So I went into it interested and excited. And I was like, I want to know what this is about because it sounds crazy. <sighs> and I thought it would be fun. And then this is the movie I got. So I went into it open minded the first time I saw it. Now, the first time you saw it. Is this the first time you finished it? This is the first time I have completely finished oh, it. Wow! Holy! Like I, I go. legit, like I legitimately want to comfort you as if you were a victim right now. <laughs> like legit. And Sean, uh, when what was your first exposure to nothing uh, but trouble? I, I mean, I had to have been like between eight and ten when I first saw this movie. When I first saw it, I had seen this movie a lot. Uh, it, it, it appears in my memory um, as going through tonight. I'm like, yep. I remember sitting down and watching this in the living room a lot when I was a child. So uh, between eight and 10 and then for probably the next four years, whenever it was playing on TV, I was watching it a lot. Yeah, mm-hmm. I should say so I was movie, 25 when I saw this for the first so time. So this movie has been with me for a long time. Okay. Okay. So we got you like voluntarily sat down and watched this on a regular basis. I did. You're not going to like me tonight. <laughs> <laughs> like uh, you, you had a tape or it was always on TV. 
Always on TV. I think okay. USA played this all the time. Okay. I was going to say, it was either USA or TNT. It was on a lot. Yeah. That is a common refrain amongst our mailbag, which we're going to get to later, because it turns oh, nice. out a lot of people have seen and have strong opinions on Nothing But Trouble. So this movie, um, it's written by Dan Aykroyd, directed yeah. by Dan Aykroyd, stars Dan Aykroyd, is based on a story by his brother, I, uh, Peter Aykroyd. Yes. How did yes. this movie come about, Sean? Well, apparently, uh, Dan Aykroyd was, uh, <laughs> you could say based on a true story for this movie, if you only count the part where he gets pulled over and then taken to court for a speeding ticket right away. That's as far as true story as that goes, because that's what happened to him. And so he took that idea. But then if you know anything about Dan Aykroyd's brain, the rest of the movie is what came out of his brain. Um, it's not I'm all truly, that. I am truly surprised that he did not open this movie with loosely based on true events. I mean, I'm really surprised. I'm kind of surprised as well. Um, but uh, well, I heard Akron was also known for taking uh, the ideas of the cast and crew, crazy as it was, and putting them in the movie. No idea was too crazy to be put in this movie as they were making it. Well, stop me if uh, you've heard this before, but I also heard that, I mean, in addition to so yeah, he got pulled over somewhere and he was taken before a judge, but he mm. was famous. So the judge like invited him to right. stay for tea. Like that was part of like him getting off of the whatever speeding ticket or something Sure, was that he had to stay and for three hours had a conversation with, he didn't say it was good or bad. He was just like, this is weird, right? <laughs> this is also the plot of like Doc Hollywood. Uh, but right. you know, you go in right. a small town, there's a small town judge and, uh, then you have to, you get stuck movie. there. Um, is that also son-in-law? I don't think so. Anyway. No. Um, no. but I also heard, and maybe you heard this story too, that like, uh, Aykroyd's producing partner or something had somehow fractured a rib or something. He was in great pain and he wanted to go to the movies, I think with Aykroyd and his brother, Peter. And so they said, well, we better not go to a comedy because that'll hurt you right you're gonna laugh you're gonna hurt mm. so instead they went to see hellraiser uh <laughs> and, and oh. saw hellraiser in the theater and people laughed at the movie you know because i think that's the thing with horror movies right you have that kind of uh the nervous laugh to let right. off that's uh, shocking. You know, anxiety yeah. stuff or maybe people just thought hellraiser was funny that kind of ironic laugh and so they said we should make a horror movie that's funny and Aykroyd was like, well, I have this idea because uh, I got pulled over and had to stay at this judge's house. So, like, wouldn't and wouldn't that be a good idea for a movie? So, basically, what they came up with is, like, a comedy version of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Is that a fair yeah. way to describe? Yeah, that's fair. Very Giving it a lot of credit, assessment. I think. Well, just it's say I, I say by story structure. Um, so Texas Chainsaw Massacre, I think you know we've talked about it before because we watched Texas Chainsaw Massacre two on this show, mm -hmm. which this also kind of resembles in some way. But the idea that you're going to have people uh, from an urban environment who go off the road in the country and end up uh, in this like just nightmare, the progressive nightmare scenario at the hands of backwood hillbillies. Uh, who have their way yeah. with them. Um, city slicker's right, worst nightmare. But this movie is billed as a comedy everywhere. It is never listed as a horror movie anywhere. So, like, to me, like, what is this movie's intention? Is it supposed to be funny? Is it supposed to be scary? I don't think it really knows. I think they're trying to be funny. All yeah. depends on us whether that uh, yeah, it's not, not working. It's not funny. Well, I don't <laughs> think I don't think they have the um uh it's like they don't know how to, they're not horror filmmakers, right? Even though, you know, there are moments of Ghostbusters, which Aykroyd also co-wrote, which I think kind of have like, eh, this is like, you know, you're going into like real horror territory in mm. some parts of that, where they kind of play the spooks as serious. Um, this doesn't yes, the ghost have... blow job scene was, horrendous. <laughs> but you this doesn't correct. have any like tension, uh, suspense sequences really, I mean, it, it. So instead of doing that, it does. It goes for the gross out. Is that fair? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Definitely. Okay. So the movie stars um, four people that we are going to tonight induct into the Saturday Night Freak Show Wall of Fame. That's right. Thank you, this, Sean. This is the move. 
Four, was that was this your chess move? You're like, I'm gonna get these four people. I'm gonna get them all. Yeah, now it's just to see how many people I can get on the wall with one movie. <laughs> okay, I, I got the record now. Four uh, that's pretty good. Okay, well, you tell me the other movies. So we have inducted Dan Aykroyd into the Saturday Night Freak Show Wall of Fame. What other shows have we done of Dan Aykroyd besides Nothing But Trouble? We've done one and two of Ghostbusters. Boom. There you go. Okay. All of this information yeah. comes to us courtesy MF Mad because uh, he is the keeper of the Saturday Night Freak Show Wall of Fame. Chevy Chase. Chevy. Chevy. Not Chevy. Chevy. Chase. Uh, ooh, what else do we watch Chevy Chase in? Right. These are guest, guest spots in anyone. He was in Last Action Hero as himself, and he was in uh, Hot Tub Time Machine. Which we did oh, on the Saturday boy, night Jesus. freak show, believe it or not. What a, what a trio that. of movies to oh, get my. you on the wall. Yeah. Right. Holy shit. Demi Moore is on the Saturday night freak show wall of fame. Thanks to this movie. What else was she in? Ghost. Correct. And you're not going to get this one. Ghost two. <laughs> Deconstructing Harry. Which, oh, yes, no. we did on the Saturday Night Freak Show podcast, if you go back oh, to the archives. <laughs> and also, Brian Doyle Murray is making yeah. his appearance on the wall because of... Oh, I mean, he, that could be anything. He's in... Yeah, that dude's been every, in so he's much. In, he's in every film. He was like Ghostbusters? I have no idea. He was in Ghostbusters 2, and yeah. he was also in Groundhog Day, which we did uh, on Saturday Night Freak. Like, all these titles. I'm like, I wow. can't believe. Yeah, Jesus Christ, there's some questionable <laughs> yeah. shit in this fam- podcast. It was, it was I, a I different imagine, time. <laughs> I imagine Colin just pounding his head on the bar when these came up. Um, okay, so these are, well, Brian Doyle Murray in this movie also has a, a limited uh, role toward the end. Yeah. So the main uh, actors here, we got uh, Dan Aykroyd, Chevy Chase, Demi Moore, and John Candy. Um, so set us up, Sean, what, how do we start this movie? What is this movie about? I mean, we start this movie, um, we start right off with Chevy Chase, don't we? It's, uh, Mm -hmm. we find him in the city. Um, he's a, he's a banker, a financial advisor in the city. Um, he's he's not a banker, Sean. No, he's a financial, a financial publisher. There you go. Specifically. (laughs) Um, and he's throwing a party that night, and he happens to run into Demi Moore walking her dogs, and they live in the same building. Um, they end up at a party. Demi Moore needs to go somewhere, and Chevy Chase, as you say, uh, this offers to drive her there. Yeah, boom. So, there you go. Romance is you about go. to right bloom, right? We got some sexual tension because uh, these two people are meeting at this party, and they're going to go on this road trip. Uh, I, yeah, I missed like why she needed, they all need to go to Atlantic city. There's a meeting that they got to get to. That's never addressed it, again. It's basically it's to literally get them on just, the road. she has to meet with the client. That's literally all the information you get. Cause it's yes. not important yeah. because yeah, it's usually really these type of movies, right. And I mean, I'm saying it's a type of movie yeah. because this is a structure that has been, I mean, this movie sits somewhere between Texas chainsaw massacre and like house of a thousand corpses. And usually you catch up with the people on the road, right? And then they get detoured somehow. Wrong turn. Same thing. They're already on the road. You don't really see what they do ahead of time or how they meet. I was like, why is this movie breaking that structure and showing us this preamble? Um, Because of Chevy Chase. Because he said, we got to do this or what are you saying? No, because uh, I'm guessing it's because we need to give Chevy Chase uh, uh, room to do his thing. Like, I, I believe that's the purpose of the opening of this movie. Besides making those two meet. Um, I think they wanted to specifically give them little introductions. So, you know, Chevy Chase could be funny in this movie. Was he funny? And do his little stuff. Chevy Chase. I enjoy Chevy Chase. That's me. Like I like when the, when the the point where the, like the sausage is coming in front of his face and he goes, like shit like that makes me laugh. There's a very specific Chevy Chase charisma. It's not yeah. necessarily like spoken one liners, punchlines, jokes. It's like a charisma. He has his, general aura is the comedy yeah, yeah he has like a um, deadpan reaction to things yeah. i think that's part of Reactionary his appeal comedy that's pretty yeah. much what it yeah, is yeah. yeah okay all right yeah and falling yeah. down he was known for falling yeah, down he loves so pratfalls you know, yeah loves a pratfall and like i don't remember him doing any in this movie or like in uh fletch 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 his best movie uh some people would probably say that there's a lot of fans of fletch out there yeah <laughs> i'm He's gonna be spies like know. us i've never, I've never seen it fletch fan 
Okay. Um, so, okay, the way I was reading this, right, the way that this was here was because this movie is, um, this is a yuppie, uh, a, a, an urban upscale yuppie nightmare, right? Where we have to establish that this yep. guy is a financial guy, like on the upside of uh, of uh, Manhattan social life, who's going to go off and run into hillbilly inbred country bumpkins who want to kill him. <laughs> you yep. know, um, so they hit the road, but they're not. I mean, alone. that's my that's my fear as well. Yeah. Okay, but usually, usually, I mean, you don't know. Like everybody else in these movies, is like, there may be city slickers or something that kind of run. You know. But uh, specifically, this one's like, you know, these guys are wealthy and they're going and they yeah. take two uh, passengers with them. Who are they? Oh, I don't remember their names. Oh, Anybody else? Call them the Brazilians. <laughs> the, the Brazilians. Yeah. Let's just call them the Brazilians. Yes. His, One of them's his, the guy yeah. from Angels in the Outfield. Yeah. Taylor. His Taylor. Brazilian neighbors. Taylor Negron. He's uh, uh last Boy Scout fans will remember him uh, from <laughs> from that yeah. movie, too. Um and his uh wife, girlfriend, girlfriend, sister. 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 There you, go. <laughs> you wouldn't know until he said sister. Yeah, at the end, yeah. And uh so there are these uh, so now you got the odd couple, all four of them, they're gonna go out on the road and uh, instead of just driving straight to Atlantic City, they take a detour as you are not supposed to do, because that is the rules of that light the horror movies are trying to teach you is don't go off the path. There this goes back to yeah. Little Red Riding Hood, right? Is the Texas Chainsaw Master? We say this, this is like basically Hansel and Gretel. Like the, you find the house and the house is bad. You don't go to the house. Whatever. Anyway. Kind of, yeah. So they end up going through this town called Valkenvania, mm. um, which is basically inhabited by uh, porch dwelling uh, beer swill or whiskey swilling <laughs> overall wearing. <laughs> it's the dust ball all of the sudden in this town. Yeah. 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 We went back in wise, time a hundred years. They had yeah. to use one of the old West towns. And the only way they thought to uh, update it was to pave a road right through the middle of it. So it didn't look so old Westy. Really? <laughs> yeah. But that's an old West. <laughs> it looks town. pretty old like, Westy. Pave the road. It'll look cool. <laughs> and put a big, uh, like uh, vent in it because the town yeah. sits on top of a coal mine. That's on fire. I think, right? Yeah. Like silent Hill yeah. fire for years. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Which that's, that's based on a real place in like Pennsylvania that's been on fire for like 80 years. Yeah. Yeah. I think silent Hill is also when they did the movie, they incorporated that kind of mythology in there too. Um, so they, uh, of course, as city slickers are want to do, uh, disobey a traffic sign. And here in Valkenvania, we have, uh, like, you know, very strict, uh, uh, law. And so the policeman, is played by John Candy, um, mm-hmm. and he tracks them down and arrests them and brings them before the judge. So this is basically where the movie starts, right? So where where does this judge live? Give give us a flavor of what we expect here as we pull up to this place. It's like the house from the people under the stairs, but like a hoarder version, yeah. even more yeah. so than that movie. Yeah, and not in a neighborhood. It's like a like that house in the middle of a junkyard. Yeah. It's like if it's like if the Adams family had a scrapyard. Yeah. Yes. It reminded me of uh cuz we watched recently uh 13 Ghosts. It's like if you built a big gothic or victorian mansion in the middle of the 13 Ghosts uh you know junkyard set. Oh yeah, uh, that's yeah, kind yeah, of yeah, yeah. What, what you're going with. Pretty here. much. Um So this is where we're introduced to the judge, and this is where the movie actually gets going. Who is the judge, and what does he do? Tell me a little bit about this guy. He's got a dick for a nose. (laughs) Yeah. This is, is, I think, Michaela's biggest hang-up. Dick for a nose. Like, I'm not exaggerating. There's a straight-up penis head appliance on Dan Eckert's It does change for one shot. He has a nose that looks penis-ish, but for one shot, it is actually... No, penis. for two. Yeah, for two. I think there's two, two, two. There's one at the end. Yeah, yeah. So two shots. Where he has an actual. Oh, right, right, right. Where, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yep. They swap it out. Um, this is. Uh, and he, ju- he looks like a character from Dead Alive. You know, looks like his face is gonna fall off into some soup like any minute now. Yeah. It really does. He is a, a haggard. He's supposed to be 103 years old. So you know, liver spots, 
Uh, uh, he can barely talk. Obviously, really yellow, like, disgusting. He's a disgusting old man. But, but it's, it's very like, loose. It's like it's like yeah. Grandpa from his skin looks from loose though. Texas it's, Inter- but livelier. It's very loose and it's very powdery. It's very yeah, like cakey. he just he's got that that big circle powder brush that he just and smacks, just smacks on, on like Bob Bill. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The yeah. texture yeah, is like really that. upsetting. It's, it really is. I I forgot how bad it is until the first shot, and I was like, oh Jesus. Now I remember oh, yeah, why we got to watch me out so much because yeah. I stared his face the whole time. <laughs> He's Michaela, played... how did this look on DVD? Oh, that's oh right. it, it's it's definitely not as clear, which I'm fine with. It obscures some of that. <laughs> You're but, lucky, really I see that hot dog in HD, Sean. Yeah, anything yeah, to not give uh, a- Aykroyd any more money for this movie. I don't care if I got to dust off an old DVD. <laughs> <laughs> Aykroyd is playing the judge, of course, and he sentences them to uh, what was the sentence for speeding? I think he says the trial, or they're going to wait till the morning and they have yeah. to stay the night. Yeah, they don't actually charge him. He's like, we'll reconvene tomorrow at four or whatever, and they they have to stay the night. Yeah, and he, so he, he you know, the, so the house, in addition to being like a hoarder house and very filthy, it also has a bunch of uh, trap doors. It's kind of like... Um, it's like a house and an amusement park. Uh, if you guys yeah. ever get out to Mount Carroll, Illinois, there's a place called the Raven's Grin Inn or Raven's Grin, which is like a real life version of this house where this guy is like, yeah. turn this thing. He gives tours like all year round. Uh, it has a slide okay. even and everything. Um, but yeah, so one of those kind of so production design wise, what do we think of uh of what they were doing, what they were going for here. Cause these, there's like a, in addition to the scrapyard and all the moving shit out there, there's also a roller coaster, you know, that's been co-opted and all, it all looks like yeah. junk that they've collected. It's like a bunch of Rube Goldberg machines everywhere in this house. Yeah. Like everything mm. is some sort of complicated contraption. And I assume that's where the $40 million budget went. <laughs> Seriously? <laughs> Yes. 40 million. She's right. In well, 1991. Yeah, but that, that's, that's about par for the course in 19. That's what movies co- cost before, uh, like, Saw. Saw came along and was like, no, we can make it for a million dollars and it'll make a fortune. Before that, everybody was like, 40 million dollars, yeah, 40 to 60. Right. movie made like eight. Well, yeah, you, sometimes you, you roll the dice and you lose. Um, I, I, will, I will say, though, watching this, it was so. There's so much going on on this set. I was like, damn, this had to have taken a really fucking long time just right? to make this junk. Like a long time. Like, like the room with all of the, the IDs on the walls. I was like, just everything in this is so detailed, like chaotically detailed, but detailed. Yeah. The basement full of squeaky toys and baby dolls. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's, that's amazing so they're going for like the big budget version of the texas chainsaw massacre in some ways that you know right the uh yeah. bone Definitely art influence. and just junk and no, antique though, stuff it's and- not scary it's this i think they think this movie is funny yeah but i, I think think they they this is hilarious well i think he well sure yeah I mean, yeah. they'd have to. They'd have to like, think this was like funny, this dude. is not even billed as a horror comedy. It is just listed as comedy on everything. I don't think he was intending to like make a horrifying movie. I think he thinks it's all funny. Yeah. Well, like I said, I think he thinks it's a it's a gross out comedy, um, but it's using the bones yeah. of of the horror movie structure. It's got mm-hmm. a lot of horror movie. Um, um, ideas in it like it's you know because i mean even having your old decrepit judge you know is like well it's kind of scary an idea but then you see it and it's like okay it's played for laughs uh yeah. the twins yeah. that show up later uh should be horrifying but they're funny you know they're just no, disgusting they're they're well, ask, i was gonna say ask holly about that one no they <laughs> I didn't laugh at a single fucking thing in this movie. You know, and the first time not, I watched yeah. it, I didn't either. <laughs> they're not funny. They're horrifying. All right, they're well, disgusting. We'll, actually, maybe we'll get to them I because the, the first thing that happens to them after they're uh, this, it becomes like a situational kind of like sketch comedy thing or it's like sketches because then Daniel Baldwin shows up right out of nowhere. This is like a whole scene that could be cut from the movie. Um, right. There are there, there's other shit. There's a surprising amount of other shit going on that does not involve Chevy Chase and Demi Moore. Yeah. 
Well, the only thing I can think that the the this is the bone bone crusher, bone yeah, splitter, like the, the bone reason, splitter. I think it's the bone splitter. It's to yeah, introduce it's the, the bone splitter this, for later, maybe. The only reason this exists is to show like that, that they do actually kill people. Right. That okay. was the whole yes. point of these people. Right. This establishes the threat, then I guess, right? Because they come in, yeah. the judge is like, "You got drugs on you. I sentence you to death." And he carts them off through his contraptions. They end up in this roller coaster. That's the ghost of the bone splitter, which is a non-gory. You know, is it supposed to be funny? They get fed to this thing that eats them up and spits <laughs> their cleaned bones out into the junkyard. I think it. I think it is supposed to be funny because it even has like the theme song that plays when it does it. I think it's supposed to be like a cartoon. It's supposed to be fucking hilarious, like itchy and scratchy or something. That's right. Yeah, yeah this Damn feels Yankees. like uh, bone this feels like Beetlejuice, the cartoon kind of. Okay. <laughs> uh, meantime, while those people are getting uh, bone splitted, uh, the the rest of the group gets invited to dinner because this is also the scene that you have to have in this type of movie where everybody sits around a table where they don't want to be. Uh, where he's got like a train running around bringing the con- condiments around the, the train or around the come on who wouldn't love this i'd love if i can make a train <laughs> pop out of my table and then ride condiments around to people i feel I mean, like i've oh, been in those too. restaurants barbecue yeah, yeah I was, barbecue i was gonna say there's condiments. one there's a restaurant that does that in uh the wisconsin dells yeah isn't yeah. it uh black barts or something right or something. is it there's, I think there's more than one in Wisconsin Dells that might yeah. even do that. Uh, yeah, like, I've, you're I've probably there, right. Yeah. I've seen that at several, uh, like, themed yes. kind of kitschy if restaurants. If you don't have it, I don't think they allow you at Wisconsin Dells. Well, yeah, you have to have some <laughs> kitschy gimmick, otherwise you can't be a restaurant. Yeah. Yep. Well, this scene contains... got to be a moose somewhere. It yeah, can, I was just thinking that. Yeah. Well, it contains the first image that I was warned about, warned, that was going to traumatize me for life in this dinnertime scene... And it looks like Holly's going to be the one who has to tell us about this because she's having the most visceral reaction right now. Oh, okay. What, happened? So, what, are having, what are they having for dinner, Holly? Okay, so here's the thing. They're having hot dogs for dinner. And now I know you're thinking, oh, hot dogs. Who doesn't love an all-American hot dog? These are not all-American hot dogs. These are gray hot dogs. I don't know. They gray. may be made out of all-Americans. They might. I think they're. I, I think this is a fucking motel hell situation. I think they're made out of the victims. They have to be, right? Something. Probably. I don't know. Now, here's the thing. I will say that watching this tonight, I was like, oh, they really just look like bratwurst, which is not as bad as I remember. But, but, but then <laughs> Dan Aykroyd eating the gray hot dog That's the bad is part. what makes it disgusting. Yep. Watching it go under that dick nose and then watching yes. it smear on his face it. that looks like it's yes. going to fall off. And he gets he mustard all it. over his face. Oh, it legitimately makes me nauseous. Too. Like, yeah. I, that is a scene that makes me sick to my stomach. This is, Legit- this is legitimately fascinating dumb. stuff to hear and to learn about, like, where everybody's little pressure points are. Like, apparently that's yeah. it. Because I was watching, I'm like, okay. But <laughs> I was like, watch no, out, I can't watch, watch it. Out, Michaela. This is just- <laughs> next time, <laughs> Colin's going to throw a sausage at you or <laughs> pretend there's a spider next to your lap. Because <laughs> that's what Colin does. <laughs> That's right. So, yeah. When we finally the meet the sausage again, I gotta say, like, I think for me, it's like, obviously that scene is really bad, but for me, it was something that was ramping up because this house is like everything in this movie is brown and gray and disgusting. Like this is an yeah. ugly fucking movie. It's fucking ugly <laughs> top to bottom. And like, for me, it's like this kind of slow ramp up because the house is this filthy hoarder mess, which kind of makes me anxious and stresses yeah. me out because clutter and like a disgusting house like that is like my worst fucking nightmare. Yeah. So I'm already on edge with that. Then I get to see disgusting Dan Aykroyd's face show up with the with the fucking penis nose. And, right. and now I have to watch this gross gray hot dog go right under this penis nose. Right. And rubbed which, all over. It's 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 the ramping up of the gross. Right. Which also this gross gray hot dog was served by John Candy in drag. That's right, because he's mute, playing his twin sister, mute? right? God yeah, man. yeah, his mute twin sister Eldona, right? Who has the yeah. hots for Chevy Chase? Um, <laughs> they, uh, I mean, the so after this, so everybody tries to escape. The Brazilians actually are like, "Fuck this!" and they go out the window, and they have to cross a toxic, uh, you know, moat, right? And they do, and then they're out of the movie. And I actually, at one point later on in the movie, was like, wait, did they die? And I fucking looked away. Right. And, like, what happened to them? They're just gone. Until, 
Right, until the very end of this movie, I was going to ask you guys, like, what the fuck happened to them? I totally... Did I miss something? So I, I'm with you, Colin. Yeah, well, that's why I was sitting there going, like, well, I'm sure if I wait long enough, all will be explained, and and it was. Yeah. Um, and John Candy also, as the police officer, seems like he's dissatisfied with the family because he's part of the family, right? What was it, Valkenheisers? Yes. Falcon, yeah. Valkenheisers, right? So the setup of this movie is basically that the Falkenheiser family has lived in this town for hundreds of years. This guy is a hundred years old. And, uh, all because they took a stock option, the family took a stock option that went shitty and they lost it all. And the whole town's economically depressed and sitting over this burning coal mine. And so they hate, uh, bankers <laughs> specifically <Yeah. laughs> and yeah. want to dole out their tortures to the, the bankers. So, um, I mean, that's your reason, right? That's what they're, that's what they're giving you. That's the motivation for the, uh, the crazy clan. And so everybody gets, uh, or Chevy Chase and uh, uh, Demi Moore get some time to explore their romance, where she says, "You're nothing but trouble," uh, right in the bedroom, and says the she does the via via ADR. Yes, she does. Yeah, because this movie was originally titled "Get Get." And and Valkenvania as well. That's I think that was Dan Aykroyd's original title for it. Yeah, apparently he but, still considers it Valkenvania. The title was forced on him by the uh, studio. Um, well, I'm glad they controlled something. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think they it, seem to be pretty hands off with every other aspect. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just like yeah, yeah. Because I heard it went over budget and all that stuff because like he was indulging as a first time director. Like you guys have great ideas, go build that. You know, bo- build a yeah. bone splitter or the boat yeah and all that shit um so the the pair end up finding a slide that's hidden in the walls this is one of those movies where like you just flip a switch and doors open and you know there's eyes in the uh the paintings you know people mm-hmm. in the walls watching you uh they end up getting split up and they go to separate rooms um uh, so uh, Demi Moore has her own little adventure story, which puts her out in the junkyard where she meets the twins. Okay. Mm-hmm. So we know Holly has a problem with twins. Michaela, oh, yeah. I know I'm Forgot not, I'm not picking that. on you for all this stuff because it seems like this is playing into Holly's specific, uh, this is like, very specifically Holly, yeah. this one, especially yeah. guys. I forgot. <laughs> so I forgot. we just watched rad and I went on a whole rant about how much I hate twins. So, Sorry, Holly. Well, tell me about these twins. Are what you? what do we got here? Ugh. <laughs> <laughs> what are their names, first of all? Uh, it's like Bobo and... It's Bobo and... Uh, Little Devil. Little Devil. Lil Lil Devil. Devil. Oh, yeah. God. So it's like... It's like if they took Tweedledee and Tweedledum but made them dead, or, dead alive characters. Yeah. Yeah, it's two guys That's in rubber suits. One of them, I think, is Dan Aykroyd, right? So everything yeah. jiggles, right? Because that's what they're yeah. going for, and they're always moving. So and they're in diapers, so they're, they're misshapen, oily. oily and dirty. dirty. We don't actually understand. Like, are they mutants or something? Like, you know, what? What <laughs> is this a product of inbreeding? Is that what we're supposed to take out of this, it's, or are they because of like, be. an accident that happened and with the pollution? This is what happens if the if the baby goes past its credits. The baby, the baby, like, <laughs> it will eventually end up as this. Yeah. You know, Colin, this movie's really not bothered with the why of anything. I don't know if you know this, but the why of everything <laughs> right. is not it's important. Just like, yeah, they were just like, what if this just exists? Yeah, and then there it is. Because all of this stuff is ter- terrifying to wealthy Manhattan yuppies. Uh, <laughs> they're going to get yes. stuck in, in this in place. White suits, yes. keep getting worse. What could be worse than running into two infants <laughs> who basically have to right? talk to and baby talk who put you in a cage? Um, yeah. Uh, I so- think Holly would just like off herself right there and then if she oh, saw that yeah. coming at her. When they, be like, when, nope. they show, when they show that like fiery pit in the middle of the junkyard that John Katie's like threatening to throw Demi Moore into. I'm like, I'd yeah. jump in. Fuck it. I would jump head first <laughs> I'd into I'd that shit. Be there. Yeah. Well, uh, uh, Chevy Chase has his own problems because, uh, another, another, we, yeah, this is again, the sketch bit, another, uh, group of, uh, you know, well, I was going to say trespassers, but that's not it. They have arrested a hearse carrying, the entire hip hop group, Digital Underground. Uh, right. <laughs> who make, why not? 
Yeah, because uh, it's 1991, and I get, I'm trying to think, like, is there a precedent for this? You just kind of, like, have, because you got to have, like, a musical act in the middle of your movie. Right. Because the judge is like, well, you're, you're artists, huh? So you got to actually, like, you know, bring your instruments in. And I'm like, oh, here we go. And I'm like, yep, for sure. We're going to have a mu- musical performance in the middle of our movie. Yep. Uh, that was. Um, nice. I don't my- think Dan Aykroyd puts that much thought into anything he does. I think he's just like, well, this would be cool. I can call in this favor. I think that's as far as it goes with him. Was Digital I, I Underground wonder, on the way up? I wonder in this instance if this was a. Uh, Studio? Um, a studio choice. Yeah, we're going to get a soundtrack sale out of this because uh, yeah. they did the Humpty Dance. Um, I thought Tone Loke was in there. Is he in, no. part of that? No, okay. I don't think so. No. I thought he, Tupac, I thought he was Tupac. 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 Yeah, Tupac. young Tupac. 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 The, you guys, now I can reveal my true uh, uh, reasons for bringing this movie. I'm really trying to get Humpty Hum on the wall. <laughs> and this is step one in doing that. I don't know what steps two and three are, but... Wait, uh, you, you know. think you can get a song on the wall? Um, or just Humpty and Tupac. Like, I want to get them on the wall. Oh. oh okay. All so right. this is step one. Okay. All right. Well, I mean, good, I'm curious good luck to see with the rest of that journey, Sean. <laughs> yeah. So, so yeah. well, I mean, he put I mean, five, people, four people on the wall tonight. There. Um, Holly, I will say your comment at this scene. I, I, I was laughing for quite a while at that because I had never even considered that this might be what killed Tupac. Yes, it is. <laughs> The mysterious what, driver in the other vehicle was Dan Aykroyd in a baby fat suit. Yeah. <laughs> no. Too soon. This is what killed him. Too, too soon. Is it covered in the Tupac uh, movie that came out a couple of years ago? That would be great. If they did, his, like they yeah, did his in time Man on the Moon. Filming, uh, nothing like but trouble. Like the Man on the Moon, so, right? We yeah. get the behind the scenes yeah. as they're filming. They bring yeah, yeah. Dan Aykroyd. To, oh, that'd be great. <laughs> Holy shit. Um, I, I do. Wish. I do choose to believe there is an alternate timeline out there where they did not do this movie, and Tupac is just alive and thriving, and he's winning like lifetime achievement awards. And <laughs> I want to go to that yeah. timeline. <laughs> yeah. Well, they are he's spared by the at the Nickelodeon Kids Choice Awards. Yes. You know? yes. <laughs> and now well, he's, hey, those, now he's on cop shows. Give it, give it five years, and Tarantino will make a movie about it. Yeah. And he'll just change that. It'll, right, yeah, and it'll yeah, yeah. all pivot. On nothing but trouble. <laughs> Give me that movie, Tarantino. <laughs> Copyright 2021 Saturday Night Freak Show. That's right. Now we're just whipping them out every week. Yep. Copyrights. Because we come up Got with it. all these fucking brilliant ideas. Um, so they're spared the judge's wrath because they can't actually uh, perform, and he, but he needs them because he makes a proposition to Chevy Chase that I will let you off scot-free from you, your charges if you marry my daughter. Right? Again. This is a horror, horrifying situation for uh, a wealthy urbanite who's like, no, now I'm going to be stuck in this town forever and in unholy matrimony with John Candy and drag. Um, mm-hmm. Actually, it does sound kind of frightening. I don't know why I'm making fun of it. Uh, so the, the <laughs> so uh, to, the digital underground is going to pay or play the, 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 the music for the wedding. And so there's a wedding that's going to happen because, of course, he's a justice of the peace, right? Um, yes. And yes. then I I do like Chevy's uh, his little I I, 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 I do <laughs> he does that pretty good. Uh, he does it well. <laughs> that's why I like it. He does it well, and maybe like like the, yeah, that's what Chevy Chase does. But you know what? He does right. it well. Yeah, it's his thing, and it works for him. You yeah. know. Well, help me connect the dots here because I think like uh, when when Chevy tries to escape with the band, uh, that's when the judge is uh, you know his ire returns and he tries to take him out to the bone splitter, right? Yes. But I thought this was kind of like oh okay whatever. I mean our heroes going out to the bone splitter. We've established what the bone splitter does, how it kills you, but the bone splitter just breaks because it's an act of God or something. I mean what saves Chevy Chase? Uh, pipe bursts and so the contraption doesn't work and so he is sure. sick and so then he's got to yeah. go rescue uh, Demi Moore what's happening yeah. with her she uh, at this point she's like befriended the gross twins and she's like playing cards with them <laughs> yeah like well, pretty seriously too yeah it doesn't feel like I mean, she's trying to escape. I think she's just having fun. Well, I mean, they, they kind of set it. I mean, they kind of set it up early on in the movie that she's, you know, she's a lawyer and she's the type that she's trying to play to 
play to what they want. You know, she's trying to play the role with it. With Dan Aykroyd at dinner, she's being very gracious and very, you know, like a good guest. And she's doing the same thing with the twins. She's pretending she likes to be their friend and she likes playing this game with them. That's right. Actually, actually, that reminds me because they are playing like I, I think that's the, the position that Chevy Chase and Demi Moore take is we're going to kind of humor these crazy people to try and get out of this situation unscathed as best we can. But that all takes a serious turn when uh, as they're exploring the house. That's right. They find the room of uh, IDs and memorabilia. This is basically like finding the uh the gr- the car graveyard in Texas Chainsaw, right? But they find all yeah. these IDs of all these people, specifically bankers and Jimmy Hoffa. It turns out, um, <laughs> come on, the, the, come on. I feel like that the got 90- up. That got I feel up. like huh, the nineties was a big time for Jimmy Hoffa jokes. Yeah. Am I right? Well, was, yeah, there was a movie. Was. Remember the uh, yeah. The, yeah, Jimmy Hoffa and uh, yeah, because there was a lot of interest. I think at that point in time. Uh, about his uh, disappearance. Um, so this is the idea that, you know, he ended up uh, in Valkenvania and the Valkenheisers took care of him. Apparently they take care of a lot of people who have come through this area and uh, killed him. And so this is where our heroes are like, shit, they're going to kill us. You know, this is serious. Yeah. Um, but uh, the later on point in the movie is uh, Demi Moore gets, uh, she's basically held hostage. They're trying to, you know, they lose Chevy Chase somewhere in this fairground, um, you know, complex and they're trying to lure him back and they're like, we're going to kill Demi Moore. So they do this by putting her in the old, uh, it reminded me of, I mean, like a contraption you'd see in like uh, 2000 Maniacs or something. Only there, I think it was a rock. They were going to crush her with a rock. They got, uh, it's like the blades of a bulldozer, right? Yeah. Or something, or like a plow. Uh, three yeah. of them hanging suspended over her and they're going to drop them down and slice her in three quarters. Um, Chevy Chase has got to rescue her. How does he do it? I mean, this is a $40 million movie, so you're not going to go like, you know, you're not going to play conservative, right? You're going to go big. No. You're yeah, going to explosions. explosions. Yeah. So we're going to blow the fucking place up with uh, all the, the fuel that's sitting around. So we got big explosions in the third act. This is how you know you're in the mm. third act. Explosions are happening. Yes. And it's getting yep. awesome. And uh, they did manage to escape at this point, right? Yeah. They end up going, running through the graveyard, and they hop a train out of town. Yeah, that's right. There's a big yeah escape. because there's also uh, there's the other cop right who is she related? Is she a Valka Valkenheiser? I think I'm just, I think she's got to be. I think it's all family at this point. Okay, um, but yeah, there's an exciting sequence where they have to run and catch a train, you know, uh, and uh, they're shot at as they escape, and so they escape, and then they go to the law, right? which I wasn't sure where they were, but they're explaining their case in a comedy kind of way to these law enforcement officers who are like, well, we got to go back there and you have to ID them. So we got to go back. Now we're out of the, we're done with the movie. Now we got to go back into the movie. Right. Mm -hmm. Which I'm like, okay, I don't know like how I'm feeling about this. It feels like we wrapped this up. You got away. Now we got to go back and like arrest the dude. So all the cops come in with all their guns and they're like, let's take them down. And then it turns out that uh, all of the law enforcement guys, every single one of them, there's like a hundred dudes here (laughs) are in on it because this again is another thing that you have to have in this structure of the movie that no matter how far away from it, you run, you're still running back into the trap. This is nightmare logic, right? (laughs) You can't get out of it. I mean, it's, it's literal nightmare logic as we find out. Yeah. 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 Um, but this is also like a big set piece in the movie, right? Where they're trying to confront the judge on the steps of the house, right? All the cops are surrounding and it's like, aha, turns out, you know, we're in on it too, because we turn a blind eye to what the judge does because he's been taking care of all these, uh, criminals and undesirables for us. Right. That's right. the, arrangement. It's, always that, it's always that reveal that the, the cops are in on it. They're like, they look the other way while they deal with the, unsavory people of uh, of this world and the cops are okay with it so but what saves us at this point in time the mine goes a fissure in the ground yeah this is your big special effects sequence right 
Yes, the house begins to split in half. The ground below it is just splitting in half, and hellfire is coming up. Yeah. Impressive? No? Not impressive? Mikhail, it was the first time you got this far. What what did you think of this section of the movie? I mean, like... This movie is irredeemable once I've hit, you know, this point. There's there's no way it could possibly right the ship. You know what I'm saying? Right. So, it's like, it's there's like, nothing it look- you could do to get you back? No. no. No, it's like, did it look cool? <laughs> yeah, I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> and like, what, ultimately, what does it mean to this movie? Like, it, like, everything in this movie is so pointless because there isn't really a plot and nothing really matters, you know? Yeah. Well, this is where you see the, uh, yeah, but I mean, uh, well, I don't know. I mean, it, it, uh, that's almost an argument that you can make against like, uh, like the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. It's like, is there a plot? Any movie. Yeah. Any kind of those type of movies where our heroes are in a predicament and they have to run. It's like the plot becomes basically survive the situation. Mm-hmm. Right. I mean, yeah, it's just the movie has to like the, what the movie has to do is come up with, you know, increasingly stressful situations for your hero to get out of. Um, and I think, this I mean, at least it's a, it's a situation that works because I mean, it's uh foreshadowed earlier in the movie. Like this is, uh, this is always going to happen. It's always been in the story. So, I mean, it works for me. That they, that, the, yeah, the, eventually this coal mine fire is going to blow. Um, and it destroys the entire junkyard and it, handily gives them a means of escape to our heroes so they can get out of this predicament which they're like they're fucked like there's no way out of this until act of god comes along and uh frees them so that's two acts of god right at least right the uh, bone splitter doesn't work uh freeing chevy chase and they're they're you know another act of god here so uh serendipitous um the uh so then the, there's there's two codas to the movie right it's like okay we're done the house has imploded fell into the fissure everything's exploded the whole town goes up in flames all right and our heroes get out then mm. we cut to rio de janeiro right oh, yeah. for the first of like a scene that i was like did we need this scene what do we establish with this scene that dennis got away Who's Dennis? Dennis, well, it's John Candy. He's the grandson of Dan Aykroyd's judge character. He's the cop who was kind of unhappy with the family. Yeah, Right. And he was convinced to let the Brazilians go. uh, And they've convinced him, like, join us. Get away from all this. Please, we're rich. We'll give you anything. And so, like you said, this is the coda to that, where (laughs) John Candy has become their head of security and his little sister's lover. Yeah, And I'm sure freakier things happen between all of them, it feels like down there. <laughs> I mean, let's get that feeling like there's we're, just some... we're, at that, we're at that level of gross with this movie. So sure. Yeah. And this there is a go. scene that we have to have because we didn't kill the Brazilian ears. Right. Yeah. So we have to like say, okay, this is what actually happened to them. Yes. They did get away. Yes. They're with John Candy that, you know, he came over to their side and they are going to be happy forever living in Rio. Uh, then. We find out, well, what happened to Chevy Chase and Demi Moore? Did they ever get together? They married? Like, what's going on with them? Yeah, they made it back to Demi Moore's apartment or Chevy Chase's apartment. I'm not clear whose it was. Um, And Chevy Chase is apparently having a nightmare about the situation. And he comes like a, to like you. a dog would when they're, when yeah, they're taking a like nap. Like a dog would. The, the yips, the yelping. Like, Which like, I can I can guarantee I, that twitching. was what he was doing. That's his motivation. <laughs> yeah, I'm a dog guarantee. having a dream right now. Guarantee. He flips on the TV. The news is on, covering the the underground mine explosion. And they go to the little town to talk to one of the locals. The local turns around, and it's the judge himself and his penis nose. Yep. He has the penis nose in this scene. That's right. Yes. Yeah. And he, and he's got uh Chevy's ID and he's like, we're coming to see you. That's right. I'm yeah. coming to my live with my, my son-in-law. Oh, my the horror. Son-in-law. Yeah. <laughs> the horror. You can't and, you just kick it away from it. <laughs> and then and Chevy the Chase mo- runs through a wall. The movie ends with an actual Chevy Chase outline <laughs> hole in the wall. That's right. Come just on. like, like a, a cartoon l- jump cartoon. Yep. Through a wall. Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, at this point, is that like outside of the bounds of something that this movie is willing to do? It's like, okay, you either, no, I think you, like, I think you either see that, you know? yeah, I think you either see that and go, yeah. okay, and laugh, or you're like, fuck you, like it's either <laughs> yeah. it's the final, yep. it's the yeah. final point, it either goes yeah. one way or the other. Yep. 
All right. Well, I am kind of curious to find out which way it went for uh, the, for the, the three of you. Uh, I wonder. <laughs> I know. Like, how is yes, this going to go down? Question marks everywhere. All right, then. Well, then we're going to put you on pause, listener. We want to keep you in suspense. We're going to put you in more suspense maybe than the, <laughs> than the movie does. You're going to have to wait for us because we're going to, first of all, read some of your mail. In order to do that, we're going to have to summon our mailman. His name is Igor. Bring us the mail. Masters, masters, the mail. I've got the mail. So many letters. Our followers are rising, rising. Why, thank you, Igor. Your job now, Colin. Oh, I hand it off to it you. Doesn't sound you the same. I'm sorry. Down tunnels. <laughs> <laughs> I have uh, a I mean, house probably. like that. I mean, what? I live in that house. Well, I mean, it's. Cleaner. I'm surprised you don't have slides in your house, Colin. I have hidden room. One. You you do. Yeah. There's a dummy. There was a dummy in that room for a long time. <laughs> I, know, I, should, I know. I should bring him back and just like bring him out here and set him up in the corner. What's uh, his name, Colin? Uh, uh-huh. That was um, uh, Mr. Marbles. Uh, Mortimer something. Uh, Mortimer <laughs> Snurd. No, I, I can't remember. It wasn't Charlie McCarthy. That's it. I think Charlie McCarthy. Anyway. Why? Because uh, <laughs> he's famous. You got to look him up. Uh, okay. Anyway, okay. I know uh, nothing about this world you live in, Colin. I know. So <laughs> Colin, you say that like we all know famous ventriloquists. Like, right? you, you, you don't know famous ventriloquists? Okay. <laughs> so we know shitty ones. I know a few shitty ones. <laughs> um. So anyway, we want to let you know, listener, how you can participate in this interactive portion of the Saturday Night Freak Show. All you have to do is follow along on Facebook. Facebook.com slash Saturday Night Freak Show. Or Twitter. At Sat Freak Show. You can email us. Saturday Night Freak Show at Yahoo.com. Or follow along on Instagram at Saturday Night Freak Show about tonight's movie, Nothing But Trouble. Everyone wrote in. First of all, Karate Warrior 2 writes in and says, This movie has scarred my brain through being such a confusing watch. I remember it being on eternal repeat on the movie channel during my teens. It was torture. So here's my Mm. challenge for the Saturday Night Freak Show crew. How do you fix this movie? No. How do you fix it? You destroy it. (laughs) Yeah, I was going to say, take the the right out of the equation. (laughs) I think you give it with it. fire. That's how you fix it. I don't think you can fix it because we compared it to Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2 and People Under the Stairs, and I hate both those movies. So yeah, I don't think I, there is a good I version. I fucking hate both of those. So yeah, yeah we'll I think see. I think Rob Zombie did it. It was called The House of a Thousand Corpses. I mean, it's yeah. basically you make it like you know we're gonna go extreme and you know whatever. Right. Anyway, you don't make it funny. Yeah, I think that's yeah. Uh, Scoop Rangoon. Or, or if you make it funny, you actually make it funny, like you know, like a fucking cabin in the woods kind of movie. And yeah, I think exactly. I think you change the characters to more every every man kind of people, and not uh, snooty, uh, you know, investment bankers, <laughs> because right. you know, your your point of identification is like whatever. Uh, Scoop Rangoon writes in and says no. He actually said that uh, this movie yeah. deeply <laughs> disturbed me when I watched it on HBO as a kid, and it still gives me anxiety whenever it resurfaces, like when I see ghoulish pictures of it posted on Twitter. Oh, he's calling us out. Uh, <laughs> it reminds me of a nightmarish fever dream that Digital Underground Tupac made an appearance in. You know, pictures of this movie really should have that like box over it that's like this is like upsetting content. You know, click <laughs> we to should like every- reveal. When you picture, yeah, when you post a picture of Dan Aykroyd, blur his nose, no matter what, just blur it out. Uh, we didn't just get censored on that one. Blur, so. blur one thing out in every photo you post for that. Well, Chris Crawley says, "What's going on with that nose?" Mm. There you go. Yep. It's a Too penis. Much. It is a penis nose. Simon what, Carter. What are the odds it still exists <laughs> somewhere? Like they kept that. They kept sure that. Dan Aykroyd cherishes it, so I'm yeah, sure probably he's got it. He has it in a gold some- case. Did it's we mention Tupperware somewhere that the judge at some point when he's in his bed chambers and Chevy Chase is looking through the wall removes his nose and he just has like a skull you a hole in the face his teeth yeah it's all disgusting he takes his leg off he's like barely there he's like Darth Vader uh Simon <laughs> Carter says I totally missed this movie I've never seen it so I might be late to the party here but come on that nose is a dick right yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh, Mr. Red, one twenty-three. 
There's a little bit of wiggle room. Here's what you're saying. <laughs> oh, don't say wiggle room when it comes to the dick. Uh, oh, oh. Uh, oh. Mr. Red123 says, keep an eye out for Tupac singing back up for Humpty Hump. It's a horrible movie in all the best ways. Mm-hmm. You had me in the first half. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, Michael Whitaker says, when deciding between being a comedy or a horror movie, they forgot that it also should be good all kidding aside when i was younger this movie made the rounds in hbo a lot and i found myself watching it a lot and being weirdly fascinated with it maybe because it's filled with actors i like and everyone's actually doing a pretty good job this is also the start of the downward trend for john candy movies r.i.p mm. okay. yeah, yeah. yeah. who wrote that colin who wrote uh that was michael whitaker Okay. Um, Nelson Nascimento says Dan Aykroyd sort of tries his hand at the Texas Chainsaw Massacre a la SNL sketches, sort of. Does he succeed? Your mileage may vary. I used to watch this all the time on cable back when, but I can't say how I would feel about it today. Looks like it's time to find out. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, God, listeners, you do not have to watch this. Listen. It's a man with an adventurous spirit right there. You have to watch it. Uh, Ed Snyder says, as a kid, I was always a sucker for movies that involve places with secret passages like this in the Goonies. That being said, whenever I watch this, I think of my childhood. Therefore, it holds a special place in my horror heart. I also remember the Mr. Bone Stripper scene. Whenever I think about it, I need to give it a rewatch. Andrew, I can, I can make a pass for childhood nostalgic attachment. Yeah. When you're a kid, you don't have any taste. Yeah. Andrew John says, uh, this is, of course, when we're saying that we were watching it. Oh, my God. I collect the most extreme horror films like it's my job. But this is the one film that truly disgusts and disturbs me. Well, now that you're watching it, I'll pop it on tomorrow and make for a disgusting birthday watch. (laughs) My wife will freak out at the hot dog scene, as she always does. So gross. My man. (laughs) That is my review. That's my wrap up right there. <laughs> well, Andrew, I'm sorry that we're so late, but happy birthday. <laughs> happy birthday. Happy yes. And don't do that to yourself on your birthday. You deserve it. No. Do it. Yeah. Do it. Uh, Andrew Celebrate Bradford. Yourself. Don't punish yourself. Well, this is the way he likes it. Well, you know tormenting his wife there you go you should have hot dogs on your birthday it's too late uh andrew bradford says this is a really crap movie not even digital underground could save it it's not even worthy of the so bad it's good accolade Mm, preach uh brandon lutmer says i hate this movie so much uh apple leva says movie (laughs) no bueno saturday night freak show commentary far more entertaining yeah we hope so we hope (laughs) thanks uh, the Newfeld says, "From what I've he- from what I've heard, I'm so sorry." Uh, Sean Matthew Whiteford says, "I love this movie," and Jolo Ho Ho says, "I love this movie." Shut your shut down your mind off, drink and smoke a lot, and enjoy. So well, there it is. I need to watch this movie Stone Cold Sober, which did not help. <laughs> no, it didn't help. Um, <laughs> All right. Well, about uh, two weeks ago, we watched a movie called Rad. Grant Parrish wrote in and said, Tally Shire also, in addition to being in Rad, plays uh, Jason Schwartzman. It's his, that's her son, right? That's what we established in that show. All right. Jason Schwartzman is Tally Shire's son. So she says, Tally Shire, he says, Tally Shire plays Jason's mother in I Heart Huckabees in a very yeah. unusual scene in which she yells, God, where are you, a bitch? You're a bitch. How many kids do you have, bitch? It's just nice to know. That Adrian still has some fight in her. Oh shit! I haven't seen that movie in forever. I'm, I might have to go rewatch that. Yeah, you remember like the six months everyone in the world was obsessed with that movie after it came out, yeah. and then everyone's forgotten about it since then. Yeah. yeah, I remember liking that movie a lot, and now I'm like, yeah. I don't really remember it. <laughs> yeah. And finally, uh, we were talking. Um, Rad was directed by the stuntman turned director Hal Needham. Uh, Travis Legler says there's a documentary on the making of Smokey and the Bandit called The Bandit. It's on iTunes, Amazon. I think the most recent Blu-ray of Smokey and the Bandit. Sidebar. I can confirm that it is, Travis. And he says, anyway, it shows Hal talking about making the movie. His son also talks about his life. And looking at old pictures of Hal, you can see Bert based his look for The Bandit on Hal. So there you go. Yeah. uh, Yeah. And... uh, just an editorial note before we go to our wrap ups. Uh, last week we did uh, No Time, no, You're Never Too Young to Die. And we neglected to mention that Vanity, the star of that movie, um, passed away at the age of 57 in what was it, 2013 or something like that? We totally missed yeah. that she died. Well, we, <laughs> we, may, we may have mentioned that in the last Dragon episode, but mm. I don't remember. 
I think we did. Yeah, yeah. we might have. Okay, so there you go. Bam. We're all set up. Now we're ready for that moment that you have been waiting for all this time to find out what the Saturday Night Freak Show podcast thinks of tonight's movie, Nothing But Trouble, starting with Michaela. <laughs> Michaela, you're going first tonight. All what right. did you think about Nothing But Trouble? Well, you know, Sean, when I pick a movie for the Freak Show, I really don't try to pick something to punish you guys because it's also punishing myself, you know? Um, that's something I definitely take into consideration. I, I can see by the past couple of movies you've picked over the past seven or eight months, you don't think that way. And, um, <laughs> I hate you guys. <laughs> I mean, I think you're a glutton for punishment, and I think that I think you, it doesn't affect you, but you know it'll affect us, and you find that entertaining. That's what I think. Um, <laughs> you're not wrong. <laughs> I think you. I am trying. I mean, the whole point is to try and get a us. reaction from you guys. So yeah. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> you know. I, like I said, I went into this movie with an open mind the first time I watched it because I was really curious because I was like, there's no way it can be as, as as insane as it sounds. It is insane, but that's not a reason to watch it. Like I one of the one of the things I have always loved about Holly since I met her is that she has always understood how deep and like scarred my disdain for this movie goes. Like yes. like Without even having to explain it, you just get why I have such a visual, visceral reaction to it, and like no further explanation needed. Always love that about you. Mm-hmm. And because like you. this movie is divisive. Either you feel that way, or you're like it's fun, you know. Um, and if you have childhood attachment to it, that's fine. If I saw this as a kid, it probably would have terrified me and scarred me for life um, in a different way than it scarred me for life as an adult, you know. Um, it has a huge budget. It has great set design. You can't discount that. Like. Uh, Mr. Bone Stripper or whatever, like cool contraption, right? That is n- not enough for a movie, though. Um, Dan Aykroyd, you know, he should have been blacklisted from Hollywood after this movie. I can't believe he was allowed to do anything after this. <laughs> like, not only is it just a terribly reviewed movie, it's got like a 5% on Rotten Tomatoes. It, mm. it was a colossal, like, financial failure as well. So, like, and it doesn't even have enough cult following now to make it financially viable. It's, 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 this movie is everything I don't like about certain movies. Like I was really getting the strong like notes of people under the stairs in Texas Chainsaw 2 on this watch tonight. And God, I really don't like those movies either. I don't like the tone. And like, if you find that fun, that's fine, but it's not for me. And the gross out stuff on top of it just makes me hate it even more. Like I said, this movie makes me nauseous. I really wanted to have a drink watching it, but my stomach was just upset watching this movie that I didn't think it was a wise choice. So I didn't, I fucking hate this movie. I will always hate this movie. You know, it's just not for me. And I think a lot of our listeners feel the same way. And I don't even think it's, it's fun or funny at all in a way that makes it awesomely bad. Like Dan Aykroyd, just like his his sense of everything is his own and he's in his own little world. And if that's where he wants to be fine, but we don't all need to be there too, you know? So hardest of passes ever. I don't think there's a movie I dislike more than this movie. So this is like the hardest pass you could imagine. <laughs> I'm going to give it over to Colin because I'm really curious where he thinks on this. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, coming into it, I, I think I had expectations built up, obviously, because this is one of those movies. You try to go into everything with an open mind. So I was, I was like, okay, I know that at least two people here tonight hate, 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 hate this movie i'm like well there must be a reason for that i'm curious i gotta see it you know is it gonna affect me the same way so i gotta tell you i don't understand the uh visceral reaction that you have you have it but like i was watching it tonight i'm like it's trying to be gross out you know it it is basically like i mean it's a pg-13 movie it's like the kids version of the texas chainsaw massacre it's relatively inoffensive in that way uh you know that uh, i suppose kids could watch it yeah they'll probably be scarred because it's like a horror movie that you know kids will freak out over um and i keep saying it's a horror movie even though as michaela said it's like you're gonna find this in the comedy section right of uh wherever you're you're looking this up it's gonna be called a comedy um it has uh stars in it doing you know okay stuff i mean i wasn't like you know, like, oh, they're doing terrible work or anything like that. Makeup, I'm like, okay, whatever. I get it. They're just trying to be gross. They're trying to be gross because they can't be scary. But the problem is, 
It's not funny. Like this, that's, and this is, I think where I'm going to come down on this movie. It's like, you're making a comedy that like none of the jokes work. I'm not even sure that they're jokes. They are, as Michaela said, jokes that only Dan Aykroyd finds amusing to the rest of us. We're like scratching our heads going like, okay. I mean, it does kind of get to the point where you're basically giving a kid a, uh, you know, like a pan in one hand and a spoon in the other hand, and he's amusing himself by banging it together. And, uh, you know, it's like how long before that kind of gets annoying. I will say it was less grating of an experience than the Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2 was. Like, I did not like that movie because I was just like fed up with it. You know, I never got to that point with this. So I was never bored. So it never committed that crime of being boring uh it just kind of eventually felt like it's just going to keep on going you know and I'm like i don't know where we're going to actually like tie this fucking thing off you know they're setting up a sequel uh i don't know but um i don't know you know i mean I, if you're uh you know you, you come from the city and you're like i don't ever want to go in the country maybe this is your worst nightmare um to me i was just kind of like i've seen this done better and i would think like you know basically yeah i mean i I wouldn't say i'm like the greatest fan of a house of a thousand corpses i'm not going to go to the mat saying this is a great movie but house of a thousand corpses also has a, a singular vision but it's trying to be the horror version of this and so i get the appeal i have a i have a stronger attachment to that movie than this one because it's like we're not going to take any of this stuff seriously it's just uh you know fart jokes and fat jokes and you know just noise visual noise and stuff like that um and it was just kind of like okay in service of like what what are we trying to get out of the audience and i think the reaction is it's supposed to be hysterically funny in which case fail so like i said (laughs) not offended by it but i wouldn't recommend it to anybody unless you just want to see bizarre cinema in which case there you go but I'm going to pass Holly. what do you think? Um, I feel like, I feel like both of you pointed out some, some things that could be like in defense saying like, Oh, it's not so bad with this. It's not so bad with that. I'm not like offended by this movie. I can't do any of that. I can't point out, any good things that could pen- potentially be in this movie. It's not funny. It's not scary. It is boring. It's really stupid. It's filled with things I hate. I I managed to put this movie behind me for 25 years. And here we are taking a monumental step backwards in the progression of my mental health. And Sean, that is on you. <laughs> so I'm not going to fault anyone for liking this movie. You like what you like. I'm not going to shame anyone. Um, but this movie is icky. And I would be doing a disservice to the entire human race if I recommended anyone watch this, even my worst enemies. Sean? <laughs> Holly, can I jump in with uh, with um, something you told me earlier this week about this movie when we were yeah. discussing it off mic? So Holly and I were texting about it because we have the both same triggering experience of this movie. Um, and she sent me a text that really still makes me laugh to this day she said i've been doing really good lately i stopped online dating i stopped browsing social media i've been boxing and doing yoga meditating regular therapy sessions and all of that is about to be shit on by a gray hot dog (laughs) it's amazing the power of that that's what it was like you gotta get the the power of that scene it's amazing by the power of gray hot dog (laughs) wow just people open Mm -hmm. eating on camera and just in this disgusting way it's like no Sound design. First, first yeah. thing tomorrow, I'm going to have to call my doctor and up my Prozac dosage. Mm. Sean, take us home. <laughs> um, you know, I'll say off the bat, I do bring that. I don't, I don't bring it to uh, antagonize you guys. Now, I do bring these things because I think it'll have a conversation with us, but I don't bring it to torture you specifically. Not, I mean, maybe a little bit, you know, because there, there, there's that little bit. It's just, just own like, it, Sean. Just own up to it. Yeah. But, uh, wow, uh, watching it tonight, man, I, I realized that I used to watch this as a kid because I remember uh, it all came flooding back to me um, as I was watching it tonight. Um, I think we kind of all mostly, except for Michaela, who's just flat out 
hating this. Um, I think we all came to a point where we're just like, I'm not going to defend this movie, but I'm not going to condemn this movie either. Um, I found parts of this movie funny. I think uh, Chevy Chase's charm, uh, it goes a long way for me. There's even some stuff that Dan Aykroyd did as the judge that I found very funny. Like when they're first, um, when Demi Moore's first up at the, um, up at the, with the judge, um, she says something like, I would love to spend more time with him. He's like, would you? He does it in such a questioning way that it makes it, it, it was, um, it was, I found it very funny. Um, there's little bits in here that I do find funny about this movie. Um, I did have that great hot dog though. I'll, I'll give everyone that that is, absolutely disgusting and it's just the look it's the mustard and the mayonnaise and the ketchup because there's mayonnaise in there too um that that scene is rather disgusting and I, I do not like it but um i'm i'm okay with this movie i mean i i laughed at it it's not you know knee slapping but there's some moments in it um again do i recommend that you watch it it's pretty fucking weird i don't I don't know. Uh, this is this is a tough one. Um, shit. Uh, I'm gonna recommend it. Uh, it's it's so it's weird enough where it's just it's a, with some weird ass shit, and I can't not just be like never watch it. I'm just like it's some weird ass shit. Maybe you should watch it. And I think that's where I'm gonna come down on this. Um, so John, do you have COVID? Uh, it's, it's, it's it's a recommendation. <laughs> you have lost your sense of taste. I may have syphilis oh, of the brain. There the it is. Thing. Oh, damn. <laughs> Thank you for listening to the Saturday Night Freak Show and good night. <laughs> wow. I suppose I deserve that. I'll take that one. Um, but yeah, I guess. You see what this movie here, does uh, to me? This is what it brings out in me, Sean. <laughs> I know. I like it. <laughs> um, uh, so I guess I'm sitting here being uh, the sole one who's, yeah, I guess I'm going to recommend nothing but trouble. And uh, And that's it, folks. We did it. We did it. We did nothing but trouble. We're all alive. Maybe not. Hope you enjoyed the past. podcast. It's done now. <laughs> Our mental health will not recover. Wow. <laughs> 2021. This we survived 2020 just to be undone in 2021. Fascinating by stuff. Nothing but trouble. <laughs> yeah. wow, there it is. Next week, Freaked. Freaked. I, for some reason, this movie always reminds me of Freaked, even though I don't think I've seen that all the way through. But it, it reminds me all the way through. Well, you know what I'm talking about, right? Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah, Alex Winter with his half face. Yeah, and the prosthetics and just kind of mm-hmm. overstuffed with. Yeah. Okay. I'm sure it'll it'll come at some point. Now that we've summoned it, yeah, damn it. Sure. Yeah. Sort of word. word. <laughs> uh, okay, so next week we're gonna watch a movie that's chosen by Holly. It can't get any worse. So. True. <laughs> what you got? Next week we're gonna watch an '80s movie called Night Beast. Night Ooh. Beast. Okay. Night Beast. Night, 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 Night Beast. Night Beast. I oh, don't man. know this. Is one. this your toy? Are we finishing <laughs> off your trilogy? Yeah. I know. I thought about that. I was like, I brought Night Claws, Night Killer. You guys challenged me to do it again, so I did it again. Night Beast. <laughs> Night Beast. Right, the trilogy comes to a close. <laughs> okay. All right. So that's next week on the Saturday Night Freak Show. We hope you will join us. And until then. The basement is going dark.